Chapter 20, Part 2, page 264. Lucretia Cutter's car rolled out of the gates of Towering Heights and drove past the empty Renault 4, a white transit van driven by the two men dressed in black who'd been with her when she'd visited Humphrey and Pickering, followed behind. Darkus and Uncle Max were crouching behind the Renault 4, and as soon as the vehicles had passed them, they scurried in through the open gates of Towering Heights and pressed themselves into the beach hedge, where their crack commando unit of beetles was waiting for them. The gates swung closed behind them. Look, there's Baxter, Darkus pointed. The rhinoceros beetle flew down from Novak's window, looking like a miniature helicopter, and landed on Darkus's outstretched hand. Did you find Novak? Darkus asked. Did she get the message? Is she coming? The beetle bowed. Darkus looked up at Uncle Max and took a deep breath. Well, I'm ready if you are. Grit and determination, lad. That's all we need. Uncle Max winked at him and immediately felt calmer. He put Baxter on his shoulder and then stood with his feet wide and arms outstretched. First, the big black Hercules beetles scam clambered up, not stopping until they were perching on top of his head, shoulders and back. Then the green tiger beetles and dung beetles scrambled on. The bombardiers and fire beetles followed, swarming up his legs. And then the b blister beetles clung onto the arms of his green jumper. Your father is not going to believe his eyes, Uncle Max shook his head and chuckled. Darker smiled. Let's go. Uncle Max strolled casually up to the front door of Towering Heights and Darker shadowed him, his head, shoulders and torso covered with beetles. Leaning forward, Uncle Max wrapped the big silver knocker and Darker started away round the side of the house, running towards the servant's entrance. Gerard opened the door. Good morning, young man, Uncle Max said jovially, wedging his foot in the door. Darkus could hear Uncle Max shouting. The butler must have opened the front door. He knocked softly at the servant's entrance. It opened, and Novak was there, smiling shyly until her mouth dropped open at the sight of Darkus's coat of shimmering beetles. Hello, Darkus said. Can we come in? What are you doing here? And what are you doing with all those beetles? I need you to take me down to the wine cellar, he said, looking furtively up, to where the cells are. What? Why? Novak took a step back. I can't, I... Darkus could see that she was frightened. I wouldn't ask unless it was important. He looked her straight in the eye. Novak, my dad's down there and I have to rescue him. If I could do it without involving you, I would. Novak's eyes grew wide. Your dad? Are you sure? Darkus nodded. I've come to rescue him. But how? Novak brushed her hair back from her face. I mean, I need you to help me, Darkus said softly. Darkus, I... Please, Novak. She touched her fingers to the purple bruise below her eye, and after a moment thought, a moment's thought, she nodded. I brought a few beetle friends along to help us, Novak giggled. I can see. You look ridiculous. They're surprisingly heavy, he smiled. You got my message from the jewel beetle? Oh yes, Hepburn, Novak tapped the rose pinned to her dressing gown. She's simply beautiful. Hepburn poked her head out and waved her antennae at Darkus. Hello, he said to the beetle. Glad to see you've made yourself at home. Come on, Novak said. We better do it quickly. I don't know how long Mater will be gone. Novak took Darkus through the empty kitchen and towards a spiral staircase that led downwards. At the bottom was a door, and behind it, a dark, fusty-smelling room. This is the wine cellar. On the other side is another door which leads out to the cells, she whispered. Are they guarded? Darkus asked as they crept through the dark room, stacked high with dusty bottles. Dankish, Craven and Morling have a rotor. There's an office at the end of the corridor with CCTV, but they never look at it. No one would ever dare break in here. There were two men driving a white van behind your mother's car. That would be Dankish and Craven. Morling's not very clever. Mater never trusts him with anything important. We don't want to run into him anyway. He's enormous, square like a house, and has a flat nose from when he was a heavyweight boxer. They reached the door and slipped through it. Darkus found himself standing in exactly the same spot he'd been in when the butler had grabbed him except this time the corridor was silent. He looked over his shoulder to the white door with the angry beetles behind it and hoped that none were free or roaming the house. He could see the door that his dad's voice had come from. It had a number nine on it. Right, Darkus whispered to the beetles clinging to his jumper. Time to do your stuff. The beetles dropped, fluttered and crawled to the floor, scurrying forward to the door marked with the number nine. Only Baxter remained on Darkus's shoulder, his antennae held rigid and alert. How are you going to open the door without the key, Novak whispered. Leave that to the beetles. Darker slid back inside the window in, in the cell door, but it was pitch black inside. Dad, he called in a loud whisker, whisper. There was no reply. 
A line of bombardier beetles climbed up the door and fight through the keyhole. There was a gentle hissing sound as they sprayed their defensive acid into the lock and the metal dissolved. With a heavy clunk, the lock fell out of the door and tumbled to the floor, where it was caught silently by a platoon of dung beetles. Darkus pushed the door open. He heard some strange sounds, tiny hisses, clicks and squeals. Taking a step inside, he waited for his eyes to adjust to the darkness. There were no windows and no electric light. The fire beetles scurried in, their luminous spots glowing intensely like hundreds of pinpricks of light. They surrounded a dark figure stretched out on the floor. Dad, Darkus whispered, approaching cautiously. Is that you? The figure appeared to be asleep on his stomach. Dad, Darkus dropped down and rolled his father onto his back, pulling his shoulder up to his knees and cradling his head. Daddy, it's me, it's Darkus. No, his father sobbed quietly, his voice like ash. She got my boy. His beard was bushy and his hair was wild and matted. No, Dad, she didn't. I'm right here. I prayed for it to be a dream. His father's voice was just a whisper. Just another of her tortures, but all is lost. As his eyes adjusted, Darkus saw tiny black creatures on and around his body. He brushed some away with the back of his hand. He couldn't quite see what they were, but they looked like giant ants. Before he could say anything, Tiger beetles raced in as quick as lightning, grabbing the creatures with their sharp mandibles and slicing them in two, throwing them into the shadows. When confronted by the beetles, the insects, whatever they were, retreated into the dark corners of the room. Darkus could feel them watching him and waiting. Dad, listen, we're here to rescue you. His dad clutched his wrists. Son, you must get out of here. Save yourself. We're not going anywhere without you, Dad. Darkus, I'm chained to the wall. He moved his feet and Darkus heard the clatter of shackles. Bombardiers, I need you, Darkus called softly. Bartholomew Cuttle looked around, confused. Who are you talking to? You mustn't worry, Dad. We're going to get you out of here. I don't know where I am. You're in towering heights, Lucretia Cutter's house, Darkus said. Do you remember how we got here? I was in the vault. He was gone. I should have known it wasn't safe, Bartholomew Cuttle shook his head. I received a letter, a dead specimen. The beetle had been exhibiting a strange behaviour. I went to check and... What happened? In the safe, instead of my Goliath, there was a mob of darkling beetles, all waiting, rears in the air. They blew gas at me. But I must have got that wrong. Then the room was spinning, and specimen drawers were opening on their own. Hundreds of Darwin beetles came teeming out. But that can't be right, because they're an endangered species. Darkus thought back to the tanks just down the corridor and knew his father hadn't been imagining the Darwin beetles. I must have been hallucinating. And then the ceiling... And then nothing. When I came round, I was in this cell and she was there. He shuddered. She was laughing at me. She's a maniac, Darkus. He looked up. She wasn't like that when I knew her 15 years ago. She's dangerous. She was saying terrible things about... He shook his head. You must get out of here now. Dad, listen to me. You were kidnapped by Lucretia Cutter's beetles. She's doing some kind of genetic engineering experiment on beetles. I don't know what for. But the beetles that gassed you, they work for her. Darkus, beetles can't work for anyone. We tried that many years ago and all we managed to make were beetles with personality. No, Dad. Listen, I've seen her beetles and they're angry, like hungry wolves. And they did it. They kidnapped you. It's been all in the newspapers. You never left the vault through the door. Eddie was outside the whole time. You just disappeared. Disappeared? But... Those Darwin beetles carried you away down the air conditioning shaft. But that's impossible. I would have... Well, that's where Baxter found your glasses. Baxter? He's a rhinoceros beetle. One of the good beetles that are helping me rescue you right now. You must listen to me and do what I say. We don't have much time. 